Hey guys, Massimax here, and today I am playing In the Pause Between the Ringing, which is a an Indian game, I think. I don't really understand the story. Okay, WASD to move, mouse to look, E to interact, escape to quick, H for help. This work is adapted from an unpublished story by Mo Yuma Hassan. I apologize if I'm butchering Indian names now. I really want to be like that. <laughs> Written by the Jujarati uh, poet in 1958 for the editor of the Malwa Chronicle. <sighs> it is reproduced here with permission from the Society of Pres for Preservation of Obscure Fictions. Ooh. To be complete is to be enclosed. To find yourself contained within the margins of your own body and the boundaries of collective reason. To be complete is to be able to see an edge to history. In the pause between the rooms. Music by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That is my big phone. Hello? This... Namaska electric has sub hib <laughs> electric burst crackles in response and then pauses. I wish to speak to a ghost. Why do you want to speak to a ghost or who are you? Why do you want to speak to a ghost? S sometimes says the voice after my thought. A ghost is the first historian of time. Sometimes hers is the only rec recollection. I am a connoisseur of such residue, for I am a Sukradha, a narrator. Thanks for the definition of that. <laughs> a holder of threads and the giver of meaning. So tell me, is there a ghost that I can speak to? Yes, there is. I'm a. I am a ghost. Whoa, that would be weird. <laughs> a sutra. Ha. Huh. Allah be praised. <laughs> I. I don't want to go this way because that's like the. That's like the uh, the douche response. Like, oh yes, I am a ghost. <laughs> Even though I picked up the phone. There are hope that my story is done and my part is played. Tell me, are you here to grant me release from this purgatory? Are you here to narrate an end to my story? Narrate an end. N narrate an end to your story? Asked the voice. What do you mean? Who are you? Are you the ghost? Oh, I'm a ghost! Yes, I am the ghost you seek. Okay. I did not know that I was the ghost. Yes, I am the ghost you seek. I am the... <laughs> in this town, away in the day when my story is made whole again. Is that not why you asked to speak to a ghost? Oh, no, no, <laughs> laments the voice. I seek a ghost, yes, but... Sahib, I know nothing about your particular predicament. I seek a ghost to help me remember. Remember... Remember? Remember what? My stories. Tales of immortal viceroys and indolent pashas. <laughs> of crocodile processions. And the marriage of mountains. Stories from across the border where I no longer belong. Stories that were taken from me 
some lost and others forgotten. Forgotten? Lost? Oh my god! <laughs> what manner of... What manner of... Sutra... Uh, <laughs> what manner of narrator are you? Curse you and your tribe of... In... <laughs> god damn it, why is it? This is our then full street to read. <laughs> In succulent tyrants, purveyors of deceit and polluters of time. But instead of him, I. <coughs> <coughs> says the voice and stops. <laughs> As if hesitant to commit to a course that would entangle its search with my own. Curse you! Oh, bit of lag. I'm shouting now, fearful of this one chance to escape. Each, each grain of time that I must abide sc scours my soul. Let me loose from the entanglement of my tail, or I shall drag you into this never world of a town to wait eternity alongside me. <laughs> Patience, Sahib. Sahib. Sabra Karo says the. I'm thinking Japanese language there, buddy. Oh man. <laughs> says the narrator. Its voice quivering, whether with distance or the strain of our conversation, I cannot tell. You mentioned a town, Sahib. Tell me more about this town. Perhaps I'll remember some of your story. Were you to describe to me where you are? What could I say of the town? It has narrow lanes and tall buildings. Psst. Ooh. It's actually pretty cool how they use the phone ringing sounds almost as the sound design. What the? Oh, don't tell me. Oh, no, I'm not going to be going on upside down at any point. No, not that way. Ah, here we go. Oh jeez. <laughs> okay. What was that? Wait. Is this a loop? Is this one a loop right now? Yeah. Oh wow! We're going to the bright spot. Gonna break the game. Oh my god. I could purely just walk away from the game entirely. <laughs> wow. You don't really want to be able to walk away from the game that you're playing. This is cool! I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but... Damn, it's pretty cool. Hmm. 
Okay, let's let's get back inside the game. That's enough of breaking the rules. Let's get into let's try and figure out where we need to go. Okay, this way. No. I haunt this town, yes. I wander through its clinics and offices, halls and passages, the empty boarding houses and kahanas have always been home to me. I linger in the small corner where they kept the shrine and I wait beside the ways that are shuttered. But most of all, I haunt this room. A room! Ah, all stories for men in rooms. <laughs> Tell me about this room that you haunt. Describe it to me. I can see the sky where the roof has fallen. It has a cavernous. It is a cavernous room covered by a broken roof. Okay. Okay. Hey, paper play. Whoa. Staircase. Okay. Ah, we're back in this room. I, I see it now. I can see it, Sahib, clear as day. The voice reverberates with a panic of a sudden realization. I know the place you speak of. Why, it is the record room at Telephone Nagar. It could be no other I, of that, I am certain. Blessed be Allah's mercy. You remember my story. Tell them, Nagar, what manner of place is that? Where in the name of one true God is Telephone? I'm going to go to the last one. It is a frontier town, Sahib. It trails the border near the desert of Tok. It is a town that ripened and burst long ago and spewed so many tales from its vibrant a ver verdant core that I can no longer discern distinct mem stories from the memory of the place. But surely you must know something that can help. <sighs> a fragment is all I need. Anything that explains why I am condemned to await here. Alright, Sahib. Since you insist, I will tell you the story of... Akbal and the death of Telephone Nagar. I press my phone to the ear to wake the tale. Our story begins on Wednesday, the 28th of August 1833, when slavery was abolished everywhere, except in territories ruled by the East India Company. It was then that an Irish doctor named William Brooke O'Shaughnessy decided that the world was porous and riddled with invisible <coughs> arteries that only he could see. Even as slave owners were being paid compensation, as if freedom was an infringement that had to be reparated, William sat in a garret overlooking the Hoogley River and pondered the arterial conduits of trade and commerce that had washed him like an errant corpuscle upon the shores of this enslaved country. So, William Shugnessy... I was... I was paying attention, but I'm like, I don't get any of this. So that person joined the company? Yes, and propelled by such sanguine oh. vision, he percolated into Hindustan, soaking through barriers of Bengal and Orisha as an assistant surgeon, seeping into Bihar as an opium merchant, diffusing across the Malwa landscape in search of ore for the mint, and permeating into history with his telegraph wires. From pharmacology to the galvanic cell, William used every science known to man to piece together a country that baffled him and threatened to close its paws against his probing investigations. He pieced together a country that baffled him and threatened to close its paws against his probing investigations? What? 
But what is the pharmacologist going to do? With yes, telephone yes, I am getting flight? to that. Ten yeah. years into this project, William O'Shaughnessy found himself in the desert of Tok, along with a grand caravan of miners and salt merchants, looking for veins of copper. No yeah. settlements punctuated this land except the strange scaffolds built by nomadic barbers who eked a miserable existence here. The desert which began north of Mutsiapur infringed into the territories of Sindh with an unnerving abandon. No delineations marked this border, and in a country that was slowly being distributed into small containers, this was indeed a strange place. I have been to the desert of Tok. It is a searing wasteland. What? Oh, that's a cool effect. It's all dodge to, to give the illusion of heat. Like being in a heat wave. But what the? Oh, that is. That is a cool shot right there. <laughs> There's fun there for ya! What the hell is this place? But O'Shaughnessy, to whom the world was poorest regardless of where he might be, could see naught but fissures and crevices in this land, holes in the earth, that leaked its minerals like open wounds. Mm. And here amidst meager deposits of salt and copper he discovered a deep fissure full of Bakelite. Bakelite. So verdant was the find, that within a few feet of digging into the crust, the small nodules of Bakelite gave way to crystalline obelisks and protrusions of diodes and receivers. Within 20 feet, Deposits of complete telephones started to emerge from the ground. Uh, <laughs> okay. Telephones emerging from the ground. <laughs> we are not crazy at all, people. Yes. Sir. Indeed, rich were so the mines, the ferry but the burden yeah. find so was located in that part of Tok which was deep within the independent territory of Sindh. Though this might not have been evident to O'Shaughnessy at the time of discovery, it was certainly clear to the head assayer who had procured a remarkable map for this expedition. I cannot tell you what this realization led to, but suffice to say that the head assayer was a distant cousin of Charles Napier, who called his illegal annexation of Sindh that very year. A noble piece of rascality. Hmm. Okay. This is weird. We have definitely had entered weird story territory. Cause we got telephones using now the ground to the very surface. And and we got people making their own countries. How do you punish man if he steals an entire country? Now secure, William O'Shaughnessy <laughs> embarked upon the greatest mining endeavor of 19th century India. Teams of workers were conscripted and local barbers coerced to dig the first exploratory shafts. Teakwood trunks from the Wasta forests were dragged like a giant caterpillar to be hewn into shacks and offices and to shore the mud and rock of the tunnels being dug. Geologists, cavalrymen and medical practitioners, telegraph operators, wiremen, electricians, bankers, hostelers and camp cooks, entertainers and crooks, all descended upon the site as the first tunnels were inaugurated. What year was this? Of what use are exact dates and years? Does it not suffice to say that the mines, which were as yet shallow, only about 30 feet deep, had already begun to yield great numbers of telephones, 
some small and delicate and some as large as an elephant. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hope we did build a town on top of it. Yes, I have seen such green specimens in the town. Great. Did we actually build on top of a mine? That's only 30 feet deep. That's very smart. Observation decks and elevator shafts were built. Great rotating wheels were erected to pump air into the mine. For one whole week, yeah. a train of camels unloaded brass lamps from a port that was stored in a newly built warehouse. Clothing carcanas were set up that worked our soap suit into hard shoes for the miners and made cotton scarves for the supervising Europeans. Elephants were shipped to the inhospitable desert at great cost to help pull and tug the telephones from their ponic bed. And of what? And what of the people themselves? Yes, the people. The well mining crews from Srinagar and Burma, from Ceylon and Hampi and Kadirmuga, started to descend upon um. the settlement and were readily hired. Abutting their mine shafts, there erupted countless hovels of worker colonies, or what were to be later called Khan Paras. And a little removed from the mines, there arose larger buildings for quarters and offices, churches and workshops. Each a thin walled ramshackle structure that poked into the sky. Until from the nothingness of the desert, there emerged a misshapen town. A misshapen town indeed. I'm in that town. Please tell me that we're going to get to walk upside down. I want to walk upside down. I want to experience some M MC Hesher stuff now. Oh yes, please let me get my chance to walk upside down. Oh. Yeah, that's ring. William O'Shaughnessy, who was appointed Director General of Telegraphs for his discovery of the Bakelite pits, received a knighthood in 1866 for the telephone mines. And though he left the town a little after its founding, he gave a name to the settlement, calling it Telephone Nigger. Almost sounded like you said some word I shouldn't say. <laughs> a fateful name. It has proven. And with newfound prosperity, there appeared like a tide of locusts, hordes of officers and revenue clerks, managers and traders, accountants and mumshi, members of that peculiar race who speak both Ferengi and Hindustani, a race of administrative service officers, the lower magistrates and the adjunct collectors, Indians who had been trained abroad for just such tasks of collating the whims of change. Vultures, I spin! There is a there is a decision at, at the memory of these baboons. This new and formless settlement attracted them, this absence of discreet boundaries. Where else could you live in such proximity to the British, the Dutch or the Americans who worked alongside them? Where else were you allowed to so clearly see what being an equal might be like? Not that they were equal. There were separate living quarters, of course, separate messes and places of worship and even separate streets. But to be so close to the foreigners was exhilarating. So foolish to be enthralled. Perhaps they were foolish. But remark these men for they are crucial to our tale. It was these men, these officers of the company, who on a borderless land, discovered a finite margin. For it was against the nebulous assault of sand and mud, and the uncertainties of the mining pits, that they could delineate their own form and purpose. 
Somehow the harsh land erased are the loyalties and helped keep the delicate balance of their lives in careful accord with their rulers. To the strange Melia arrived Iqbal. I Iqbal? Yes. Iqbal the barrister. Iqbal the revolutionary. Mm. Iqbal the unfortunate. Or, simply, Iqbal. <laughs> He came to this town riding a roving tide Pretty of cool humanity name. and attempting to efface the terrible years he had spent at Hertfordshire before being appointed the administrator of the Ambrose Shaft, the deepest active mine at Telephone Nigger. Save for his morning Again. rounds, Iqbal rarely <sighs> went to the actual mine. The rest of the day he spent in the cavernous records hall, maintaining a careful roster for the teams under his charge. It is the same hall that you haunt today, turning such records as have survived into paper planes in your boredom. Again, it sounds like you're saying something that is not appropriate, even though it's like... It's not that... It's not supposed to be inappropriate. Ah! What? Why am I up here? Perhaps it is the emptiness of this hall, when the rest of the town was crowded, but something gave Iqbal room to ponder. Why was the te telephone mined in only a single language he wondered each phone once extracted and refined and processed such that it would only allow English to be spoken for its receiver no other language would transmit where's the narrator perhaps it was the emptiness of this hall when the rest of the town was crowded oh my god but You're behind. something gave Iqbal room to ponder why was the telephone mined in only a single language he wondered. Each telephone, once extracted, was refined and processed such that it would only allow English to be spoken through its receiver. No other language would transmit. And this bothered Iqbal, okay, there we go. as we all do, that telephones in India have long predated the British Raj. Why even Tughlaq was known to have shifted to Daltarbad to avail the magnificent, naturally exposed telephone that sat like a boulder upon his palace grounds. One of the phones at Badami, even the chat yeah, would not use them. Our old telephones all but vanished when the Major Sajay saw fit to ban them. Indeed. And in the presence of such history, Iqbal found it difficult to believe that some small change in the refinement or extraction process okay. might not yield a modern Bakelite telephone that could speak in many languages, perhaps even all of them. Such radical thoughts he kept to himself. And, when time permitted he experimented, for his was the legacy of a Shaughnessy. And he found it easy to bend wires and tubes to his will. Mm -hmm. And much as O'Shaughnessy had done, he too began to think of the world as a porous body waiting to be punctured by cables and pipes carrying blood and sound. Blood and sound, oh. We don't need blood in our phone lines, man. I click. Reticent though he was, Word of Iqbal's experiments percolated through the town and roused a deep anxiety in his fellow officers. Those who had prided themselves on their certainties saw in Iqbal's endeavor a malevolent threat to their way of life, for their certainties were born of a particular kind of fear. The telephone was a sacred emblem of their station as the chosen ones. They feared its proliferation and they feared its authority. To mm -hmm. so debate such an august instrument was tantamount to sacrilege, of this they were certain. And violence comes easy to men who are certain. 
Oh my god. That just reminds me of the uh, Easter egg hunt that's going on on Roblox. And it's making it that you have to go to multiple worlds because, you know, end game. Um, but it's making it people go to all these different maps. And most of them are just irritating because it's the people don't get the idea in the in the games themselves that violent like being just a it's just like you're playing a game. Oh, you have to play the game properly and be violent. Like there's the ones like counter blocks that that the game sends you to and like. All those. I just want to get the egg and move on with the get and move on with the egg hunt. But nah, I had to keep getting shot in the face. And like, not even one step. And like, bang, dead. Because people don't understand the idea of working together. Oh my gosh. It's just like. Yeah, we want to win. We want to win. We want to win. We don't care if you want that damn egg in the game. We just want to shoot you in the face. Seriously. <sighs> Sorry about that tangent. Yes, it does. And at telephone nigger. This violence erupted when Iqbal proclaimed that he had perfected the first Urdu telephone and that he awaited a phone call to test its efficacy. It was oh, this geez. proclamation that killed Iqbal. They pushed him into a shaft that he supervised and he fell 1,203 feet into a hole called Ambrose. Until every oh. bone was crushed like tinder and his flesh so deeply lacerated that it left a streak of blood marking the passage of his body down the shaft. Allah have mercy. The next day, with forced joviality, lest the horror of their crime be made apparent, the murderers and their masters filed into the records room with a new camaraderie. As they reached for their muster sheets, they were startled to discover Iqbal seated upon his usual dhuri, waiting beside his telephone. His face was still lacerated and his mien was the color of a white dhoti. His limbs contorted in odd shapes with bones protruding the flesh. And his teeth rattled as he spoke in garbled bursts. But there he was, Iqbal, or what was left of him. A ghost. A ghost! It's me! The sight of Iqbal animated the memory of his murder. The records room was boarded up, though no one remarked upon the yeah. folly of entombing a ghost. People were prosecuted. The mines were abandoned. The shafts destroyed in a riot. The city dwindled and then, just as suddenly I as it had begun, Iqbal. telephone nigger became an empty husk floating upon a sea of sand, leaving just the ghost of Iqbal awaiting his phone call. What was up with that voice? Do you believe I'm Iqbal? I asked, wondering if I am indeed Iqbal. <laughs> yes. I do not know Sahib. All I can recall is Iqbal also awaited a phone call in the empty town of Telephone Nagar. That he too awaited a release from this purgatory that was to be heralded by a ringing. To which he would say, Hello. Namaskar uh, Sahib. Electric burst crackles in response and then pauses. I wish to speak to a ghost. Who are you? I am a weaver of circumstance and the giver of meaning, a connoisseur of memory. I am the last author and the first historian of time. I am a narrator. So tell me, is there a ghost that I can speak to? Yes, there is. I am a ghost. Uh, 
I, oh, narrator, I have weighed your arrival. Time has silted around me, enfolding me in a history where I do not belong. Complete this story, narrate an end to this endless waiting. What is your story? Complete your story, asked the voice. Whatever do you mean? I cannot bear to persist anymore. I have waited an eternity for this liberation. Send me back to the furrows of memory, where I can be forgotten. Is that not why you have called over the phone, asking to speak to a ghost? Oh, no, no, Lemonade. I seek a ghost to him, yes, but I know nothing of your particular particular predicament. I seek to help, seek a ghost to help me remember. Remember? Remember what? Okay, we've read this. Let's just... Yeah... No! Don't tell me it looped. What? So what happens if I went through this door and then turned around? That door was open. Oh my god! This is a. That is a cleverly disguised loop! Wow. I know where you reside, but let's see what story you belong. I cannot say. Tanapanaga was built at the fulcrum of time and on the edge of a frontier. So many history converged there that one tale can no longer be dis dis discerned from another. They have been to telephone Naga, I insist. You have to know something of my predicament. Ghosts rarely make remain unremarked. A forgettable detail, a chance encounter. Tell me the most pregnant tale from Telephone Gar. Alright, Sahib, since you insist, I will tell you the story of Iqbal and Death. Our story begins on Wednesday, the 28th of August, 1833, when slavery okay. was abolished. Okay, that is it. Accepting territories ruled by the East yeah. India Company. It was then that an Irish doctor named William Brooke O'Shaughnessy decided that the world was porous and riddled with invisible arteries that only he could see. Even as slave owners were being paid compensation, as if freedom was an infringement that had to be reparated, 
William sat in a garret overlooking the Hoogalee River and pondered the arterial conduits of trade and commerce that had washed him like an errand, Kopathal, upon the shores of this enslaved country. Okay. That is the video for today. That was actually a really good ending. It, it suddenly looped it and made you think, could that be the con could the story be continuing still? But nah, it loops, and it loops, and it loops. Oh, wow. Anyways, links to my YouTube page, my Twitter page will be down below, along with a link to a video. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to answer the subscribe button when it rings. And hit the notification bell so you know when next video comes out. Um, I'm not going to ask for likes. I never do it, so I don't expect you guys to do it. Anyways, I'm a mad scientist. Mad scientist, out.